classroom lesson. And um, today we're going to be with River Wranglers, um, Darcy and Sydney, and we're going to first of all show a quick video that they put on um, and then afterwards we'll be able to answer any questions um, and they will be able to uh, kind of take it away from there. Uh, so let me get this up and shared real quick. Do, do, do. Oh, hold on. All right, what happened? Hold on one second. Sorry. There we go. Okay. All right, sorry about that. Okay. Wherever you live on this earth, you live in a watershed. A watershed is a drainage basin. Any area of the earth draining into a particular pond, river, or lake. The watershed of this pond, for instance, is the entire area of the earth that drains to the pond. The watershed of the pond and neighboring watersheds combine to form a larger watershed for this creek. The creek may then be part of a watershed of a small lake. It combines with other watersheds to make up the watershed of a larger river that larger river feeds into an even larger river that has an even larger system of subwatersheds. And finally, the ever expanding system of watersheds becomes one huge watershed that empties into the ocean. But why should you care? From farms to small towns to cities, people's lives are connected by falling rain and flowing water and where it goes. How you care for your land affects how much and how fast water flows to your neighbors downstream and how clean that water is. And the way your upstream watershed neighbors care for their land affects you in the same way. For instance, if people upstream from you build houses, streets, and parking lots on the land that drains to your stream, you can expect more water to run off and at a faster pace, and your land is more likely to be flooded or upstream landowners who don't protect against soil erosion not only lose their soil, they dump sediment, nutrients, and other pollutants that affect everyone downstream. Without proper conservation, there are downstream consequences such as flooding, stream bank erosion, sediment clogged lakes, and pollutants in drinking water. But those problems can be minimized if each of us does our part to hold the rain in place where it falls. We can help water soak into the soil by planting grasses, tilling the land less, using rain gardens, being careful of how much fertilizer we use, and doing many other things. But we each need to do our part. After all, we are all truly connected in a watershed, and we depend on one another to be a good neighbor. I'm Darcy with River Wranglers. And I'm Sydney with River Wranglers. We're out here today on the Karst River on a cold, wintry, blustery day to talk about watersheds. Has anybody ever heard that term before? We yeah. have. You have. Okay. If anybody has a shed at home, hold your hands up like this. This looks like a shed, right? 
And what do we do with the shed? We store stuff in we it. Put stuff in it. So if we flip our fingers up like this, now we have a watershed. Our fingers are the mountaintops where our thumbs come together are the bottom of the watershed, which is a river usually or a lake where the water cools down and comes down from rain and snow melt, comes down to that lowest point. If you look around wherever you are outside and you might see some mountains, you might see desert, you might see a lake or pond or a river, that's all part of a watershed. It's where that water drains and either moves along in a river or stores in a lake. So trick question, Sydney. Yep. Do you think everybody in the world lives in a watershed? Yes. She's right. This is a hard question. Everybody does live in a watershed. If you think about it, even if you live in the middle of the biggest desert on the world, of land is part of a watershed. Let's talk about some major rivers like the Mississippi and the Columbia. Do you know where those end up? Yes, in the ocean. In the ocean. Most rivers go to the ocean and drain into the ocean. In Nevada, we are completely unique in the United States in that our four major rivers do not ever make their way to the ocean. Why do we think that is? That's a tough one. Is it mountains? We no. have a lot of mountains in Nevada, is that it? Nope. Now there's lots of states with mountains. Um, how about desert? We're also very, have very much desert in Nevada. Is that it? Nope. That's not it either. Lots of other states with desert. What we have here is the Great Basin. The Great Basin, a big sink that collects water. So all of our rivers end in the Great Basin and just drain back into the earth or end in, in a lake. So Nevada's really special in that way. So let's talk about our four major rivers. Can, can you name them, Sydney? Yep, there's the Carson River, the Truckee River, the Humboldt River, and the Walker River. Awesome. So let's first talk about the Carson River since we're right here. It is named after Kit Carson who explored this region um, with John Fremont in the 1800s and the river is named after him the city Carson City there's also the Carson sink which is where this river ends um, drains into that Carson sink out near Fallon um, this river is about 200 miles long starts in the mountains of California Sierra Nevada mountains and ends out in the Carson sink out past Fallon flows through a lot of agricultural land a lot of was a lot of mining on this river um, back in the gold rush days um, they used this river to move logs to help build virginia city the river is polluted because of that mining there's a lot of mercury in the river because the early miners were using mercury to bind to that gold and silver and pull it out of the rock and they didn't know any better and they dumped it right into the river or dumped it into the ground it made it Dayton State Park. And what's the fourth one? I, I know it. It's Fort Churchill. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fort Churchill is the fourth park. Fantastic. Fort Churchill and Buckland Station. Great place to go see some ruins from Civil War times. And, okay, I think that's it for the Carson River. What's next? The Truckee River. Uh, the Truckee River flows from Tahoe 
to Pyramid Lake. It's 120 miles long and it's named after the Paiute Chief Truckee who in the mid 1800s led a group of pioneers to California and the pioneers decided to thank him by, by naming the river after him. The Truckee River, unlike the Carson River, is a water supply for drinking as well as irrigation and agriculture, whereas the Carson River is just for agriculture and irrigation. Um, if you live in the Carson River watershed, you're getting your water from groundwater, whereas if you live in the Truckee River watershed, the majority of you are getting, are getting water from the river. Uh, the native species in the Truckee River for trout is Lahontan cutthroat trout, and it is polluted by both development, uh, like building materials, and invasive species that have been brought to the area. That's right, lots of those critters that aren't supposed to be there. Okay, next is the Walker River. Much shorter, this one's about 60 miles, um, fed by snowmelt up in the Sierra, just like the Carson, it starts in the Sierra Nevada, but it goes more that way. It ends at Walker Lake near Hawthorne. If anybody's been there, it's a really neat place to visit. Um, but this river fluctuates so much because it's been so heavily used for irrigation over the years, that it's only in the last few years that it's actually made it all the way to Walker Lake again. Um, because the river wasn't feeding that lake, it, the level of the lake went down 160 feet from 1882 to 2010. So that's a huge amount. And what happens when that happens is the water becomes very salty because the water evaporates and the salt and minerals remain. So there's not a lot of fish in that in that lake that can handle that salt level. Um, motor boats, it's bad for the engines. So often when you go down to Hawthorne and see Walker Lake, it's very empty. There's nobody out on it. Uh, there are birds around. I mean, there's wildlife, but it, it's just a very different feel to it than Lahontan Reservoir or, or any of the lakes along the Truckee. Um, it is named for an, another explorer, Joseph Rutherford Walker, in the 1800s. Um, the northern Paiute make their home along this river, um, but there have been people along the river for about 11,000 years, so quite a long time. The fish, also Lahontan and cutthroat trout, are native, but the other species, just like all the rivers in Nevada, have been introduced. Brown, rainbow trout, and brook, and brook trout. Um, but Lahontan's native. I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll move on to the final major river in Nevada, the Humboldt River. The Humboldt River flows from Jarbage to the Humboldt Sink in Churchill County. It's a very windy river so it meanders. Our first estimation for the Humboldt River was about 290 miles but because of how much it actually moves back and forth a closer estimation of its length would be closer to 380 miles. That's a huge difference. Yeah just just a That's little a windy difference. river. Windy river. Yeah. It is the only major river system that is wholly contained within Nevada, meaning it does not cross into other states. John C. Fremont <laughs> named the Humboldt River after a German naturalist, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, the Humboldt River is fed by snowmelt and rain, which is why it can dry up easily depending, dry up and flood depending on through lots of empty space and ranching land. Um, 
the, the biggest damage on the walker was that it washed out 30 miles of Highway 395, which runs right along that, which is significant. That um, the, the highway was closed for um, quite a long time. Um, and the Carson River, which again is mostly agricultural, gets closer to cities, but not big, big huge cities. Um, the damage on the Carson was about $80 million. The damage on the Truckee, however, because the Truckee runs through downtown Reno, and we should have some pictures of, of that flooding, um, the damage was significant, about $540 million, which is so much money. Uh, so much money compared <laughs> to it. So it just tells you how, um, how a city can affect that kind of thing um, with the Truckee flowing right through downtown Reno with lots of buildings, lots of bridges, lots of um, property that humans have built. But on the rivers like the Carson that have been, the open space has been better preserved. It's much better in terms of flood damage. All right, do you guys want to answer some questions for us? Of course, sorry yeah. about that wind though. That was, it was pretty windy that day. Yeah. Um, so someone is asking which river flows into Walker Lake? Ah, I think they're looking at the worksheet we sent, Sydney. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would be the Walker River flows into Walker Lake. And I hope for those of you that haven't been there, get a chance to visit Walker Lake. It is spectacular and beautiful and you should take a field trip. <laughs> we have someone asking if they drink a whole bunch of water and everyone else also drinks a whole bunch of water. How do we still have water and how is it not extinct yet? Okay, Darcy, do you wanna explain That's the a water cycle? <laughs> so yeah, that goes, that's a great question. Um, believe it or not, we all, you all, are drinking the same water that the dinosaurs had. Um, water just kind of recycles and moves back and back through the water cycle. Um, if it rains and it flows into a lake and then the sun comes out and it's 100 degrees, um, the water evaporates and goes back into the clouds and then it rains again. So it's this whole big cycle. And um, when you're drinking a lot of water, eventually that water makes its way back into the water cycle and water system and we drink it again. It gets all cleaned up and filtered and um, we continue to drink the same water. Um, we have someone else asking where do watersheds come from and how did we discover watersheds? Oh, that's a good question too. Where do they come from? I mean, they just exist. Um, if you, if you take a look at, a, if you Google a watershed map, um, you'll see the boundaries and, and lots of boundaries of watersheds are mountains. Um, it's a, it's kind of a hard concept, which is why we talk about that shed thing and then holding your hands up. So the watershed with my hands is this whole area in here, this whole bit of land and scientists figured out watershed boundaries by figuring out where that rain and snow melt goes and tracing it. Um, when it rains, just think about, go outside, look around, where's that water going? Where is it flowing? Is it flowing into a storm drain? Is it flowing into a lake? Is it going into a river and eventually making its way to a lake? Um, science and geology and geographers have figured all of that out over the years. Um, someone else is asking if all rivers are a part of watersheds. Oh, Sydney, that one's all you. Yes, all rivers are a part of watersheds. Um, it's just how it is. <laughs> Every piece of land is part of a watershed. Yeah. I mean, even a lake is a part of a watershed. It might be the end where the water all ends up, but every piece of land is part of a specific watershed. Um, we have someone else asking if you know how deep the Humboldt River is. Oh, I don't. You know, it varies because that one, it, 
is so truly dependent on snow and rain. Um, I answered two questions about, um, like just in the Q and A, oh, about the okay. depths of the Carson River and the Truckee River and how they vary greatly depending on seasons and where exactly you are along the river. And uh, I think that goes with Humboldt too. Yeah, but yeah. It would be. That's a question we can't answer. Right now it's probably pretty low um, because we're in the middle of winter. Um, we have had some snow, but it hasn't melted yet. So this is generally a low point in, the, in our rivers in the state. But at the same time, if we get a storm event like we've had in the last week, um, there was some concern about the Carson River, for example, flooding last week because we had rain on top of snow, which becomes problematic. Um, so it just, it varies so much. There are years that the Carson and, and the Humboldt, um, the Truckee less so because it's regulated or it's um, dependent on how much they release from, from Tahoe into the Truckee, but the other rivers can completely dry up in a given year and there's just no water um, versus 1997 when there's way too much water. Great answer. Um, our next question is, where do the rivers in Nevada end? <laughs> Another worksheet question. <laughs> yeah. How about it, Sydney? <laughs> um, all of the rivers in Nevada, um, I mean, they end in lakes or in sinks. And that is because we have the Great Basin, which is like a giant sink where all of the water doesn't flow out of the sink. It flows down into it. And then someone is asking if the ocean is a giant watershed. <laughs> so it, it is, there's going to be, there's going to be different watersheds flowing into it. Um, I honestly, that, that is a really good question. I don't know if there's a specific Pacific ocean watershed. I don't actually think there is. I think the individual watersheds flow into it. Um, Sydney, are you Googling that right now? Yeah. Okay, so good. A That's watershed a describes an area of land that contains land. a common set of streams and rivers that so, all drain yeah. into a single larger body of water. So, so oceans are not going to be, they're going to be the end point of a lot of watersheds. So if you think of, I guess, Hawaii, an island, there's going to be watersheds on that island, but they're surrounded by ocean. So all those watersheds are very contained. Good question. I learned something today. Yeah. <laughs> Is Washoe Lake a part of the Truckee River watershed? It is. Um, it's weird because when you're driving down through Washoe Valley, it feels like such a low point. And it seems hard to think that Washoe Lake could flow into the Truckee River because it seems like it has to flow uphill. It, it doesn't, but um, the Washoe, Washoe Lake um, drains on the north side by Little Washoe Lake, so closer to Reno than Carson is where it drains. And it drains into um, various um, tributary rivers and drainage ditches, the steamboat ditch and all of those, and eventually makes its way into the main branch, main stem of the Truckee. So if you, if you drive down um, to Washoe Lake from the, on the east side of Reno, kind of over by the Monte Ranch area, there's a whole bunch of wetlands and all of that water is, um, is coming from that area and eventually blows its way into um, the Truckee River. If you drive on Veterans Parkway in Reno, that's a great place to see a lot of those tributary little streams that end up in the Truckee. So good question. The Washoe Lake's, Washoe Lake's tough because it feels like it should be in the Carson, but it is not. It's part of the Truckee. Um, someone else is asking, how can watersheds flood? Lots of ways in Nevada, it's going to be because we have too much water. Um, you know, our dry land um, can only absorb so much water. Um, so if we have, again, a, a rain on top of snow type event um, that melts that snow really quickly, we will flood. 
Um, if we have a huge snow gear and then it gets really hot really fast and all that snow melts at once, we'll have flooding. If we have a big rain year, um, it's all dependent on that precipitation that we get in Nevada, which is very sporadic. We never know what we're going to get. And that's why we're so prone to flooding and drought at the same time, because both can happen in the same year. It's just very, very dependent on our weather, which is kind of crazy here. Um, this one I've gotten a couple times. It's if everyone lives in a watershed, does that mean that the whole world is a watershed? <laughs> no. I mean, everyone does live in an individual watershed, but they aren't all part of, at least the way scientists have labeled them. I mean, we're all part of the earth, but um, there's no one big earth watershed. We're all part of the, it's all part of the water cycle, certainly, and that water recycling back and forth. But, um, but that is a good question. I, watersheds are tough to, to grasp a little bit, but if you look at some maps, like some of the maps we had in this presentation, you can find them very easily. It'll really clearly show boundaries of the watersheds. And even within the rivers, like the Carson and the Truckee and the Humboldt, there's even smaller little watersheds that are part of the little streams that are flowing in. Um, so there's, depending on how zoned in you want to get, um, there can be hundreds of watersheds but we tend to look at the bigger rivers, you know, the Carson River, but there's a couple different little or watersheds that feed into that, but we consider them part of the Carson River watershed, for example. That was a good question, kind of a hard one to grasp. Um, someone else is asking, is the Humboldt River man-made? No, um, certainly over the years, our rivers have been adjusted by humans. Um, the Truckee a lot. Pr Truckee probably, well, I don't know if that's fair to say. I was going to say the Truckee more than any other of our four rivers. It depends on what you're talking about. Um, but over, over time, we've straightened rivers out. We've um, done things that have been detrimental, and we've learned our lessons that we should just let the rivers do what, what they're going to do. But none of them are man-made. Good question. Someone is asking how long the, the Carson River is? Carson's about 200 miles. Um, it does have two forks on it, so some people measure it differently from where the forks come together, but overall we consider it about 200 miles long. Pretty long river. This one might be another one of those uh, questions. It is, which river has a section of wild and scenic on it? <laughs> yeah, worksheet. That's the Carson River. It's the East Fork of the Carson River. Um, it's the one with the hot springs on it. If you've yeah. ever been there, it's, it's another beautiful place that if you can get to, you should get to. Someone is asking if the cracks in the sidewalks and the streets, are those a part of the watershed as well? Well, they're in a watershed. Um, I don't know if I, to call them part of the watershed, but they're certainly in a watershed. A crack on a sidewalk in downtown Reno is in the Truckee River watershed. So when it rains, that water is going to, water is always going to want to go down to the lowest possible place. So it's going to sink into that crack and it's going to make its way. Eventually, we say pretty much everything is going to make its way to the river mm -hmm. um, because the river is the lowest point in our in our watersheds. Um, so it's gonna make its way there and either end up in that sink in the Great Basin or in a lake in the Great Basin. Yep. Asking if a watershed is basically a big place for fish and water animals. You wanna take that one, Sydney? Sure. A watershed is the land that is affected by the water and that specific body of water. Um, and everything that lives within that area where the water is affected. So it's not just the animals that live in or on the water itself in the river, it's also the land and animals that get the water from that source or that recreate um, 
in that area. So it's also the people who live in the watershed and animals, everything. It's so hard to, when you're standing in the middle of a desert and we have lots of desert land in yeah. Nevada to think that it's part of a watershed, but you have to look around and look and see what you see. Do you see mountains? Do you see hills? Is there water anywhere? When it rains on that spot where you're standing, that water is going to go somewhere. And that tells you what watershed you're in is where that water goes. Um, someone I'm assuming asking from like the cycling question of the water cycle, how does water get cleaned? So what do we do oh, to clean our water? Good question. So there's lots of ways there. It, in terms of nature cleaning water, nature is wonderful at cleaning water. There's these wonderful things called wetlands. And again, if you're in the Truckee River watershed, if you go on Veterans Parkway, you can see wetlands all along that road. And wetlands kind of act like sponges. If, if you put a sponge in your sink and put some water in it, it's gonna absorb a lot of that water. It's going to filter it and clean it as that water sinks down. That's not to say water that goes through a sponge is clean. I'm not saying that, but it, it acts like that. So the plants, the animals, the layers of dirt and soil and sediment that the water goes through helps to filter and clean it. Humans, however, you know, there, there's so many of us and we can't rely on nature to clean our water for us. So then we get into things like sewage treatment plants. Um, but again, they're still using filters. I mean, we're taking a cue from nature here and, and using a filter to clean that water. So I suspect that question came from, oh, gross, I don't want to drink water that's gone through someone's body. Um, that's not a I mean, you are kind of doing that, but in a very big picture way. Um, so there, there's just lots of ways that, that water gets cleaned up, both human and, and in nature. And they all work pretty well. <laughs> Sorry, barking dogs. <laughs> um, someone is asking which river is so curvy its length is almost 100 miles. Sydney knows that one. Um, dang it. Walker? No. No, Humboldt. It's the Humboldt. That's the one that's so curvy. The, I did the all distance. the research. Yes. I still didn't get it right. Yeah, the Humboldt one is, is just so curvy. If you look at aerial pictures of it, it just is a, it's just. It's a mess. It's all over the place. And it, it's wonderful that we can there's not so much development out there on the Humboldt that it, that we humans felt like they had to do anything to it to straighten it out or anything. So it's a great natural flowing river. Um, someone else is asking, what's the longest river? The longest. So that, that one's tough because some of the watersheds are bigger and smaller and so the Truckee is about 120 miles. Um, the Humboldt, see, that's the problem one. 290 miles, but the meandering, if you measure all those meanders, 380. The Walker's 62, so it's the shortest. And the Carson is about 200. So the Humboldt's going to be considered the longest pretty much no matter how you measure it. Um, but in some years, the Humboldt's going to be so dry that it only flows for 50 or 100 miles. So it kind of depends on the year, but generally the Humboldt's gonna be the longest. Um, someone is asking, are sewers a part of the watershed? Yes. Absolutely. Um, again, I keep using Reno because there's so many good examples. If you live in Reno and go over um, off McCarran on the west side of town, so closest to the mountains, right about it at, um, McCarran and 4th Street, there's a, a sewage, a reclamation sewage treatment plant right there. And in Carson City, it's um, just east of, of the main highway. Um, you can go see it. And yeah, they're treating water there. And eventually that water is going to be um, re-released, reintroduced back into um, the water system somehow, whether it's just put back in the river after it's cleaned up 
it just kind of depends on on what each city is doing with it but um, yes definitely part of that and we that's another issue with flooding if we have major flooding on the Truckee and major um, water coming in there you can bet they're keeping an eye on those sewage treatment ponds to make sure they're not overflowing raw untreated sewage into the river how many different watersheds are there in Nevada that one's tough, you guys. That's a hard question and a good one. I mean, we consider there to be four, these four major rivers that we talked about today. But if you look at a watershed map of Nevada, the Colorado River also comes through um, Southern Nevada, but we don't consider it a Nevada watershed because it just kind of blows through here. Um, it, it doesn't start or end in Nevada, but still part of Nevada. Um, but within those watersheds, within each of those four major watersheds, there's a bunch of smaller watersheds too. And if you really wanna get into watershed geography, um, you can break it down into every little tributary stream. Most of us are not gonna, gonna do that. I and mean, um, we're gonna talk about those four major rivers. So the, the, the easy answer to that is four. The harder answer to that includes the Colorado River um, the Quinn River in, in northern Nevada that goes in, that is a seasonal stream. Um, so it can be anywhere from four to a couple hundred, depending on how you want to answer that question. Good, good question. Someone is asking, is there a way that you could tell where water once was? I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, what that makes me think of if I'm understanding the question is if you go down to Lake Powell, Lake Mead, um, you can, well, even in out in the Carson River watershed out Fallon area, you can look on the rocks and see water lines um, where water used to be. Um, especially on those lakes that the level has gone down. You can see along the rocks where the water used to be. I'm not sure if that's exactly the question that person was answering, but I'm hoping the, that's, that's where it took me. I don't know, Sydney, did you have a different thought as to what that question meant? I mean, like in some spots, like as we can see in Dayton State Park, where the river moved, the Carson River moved, um, where it used to be, you can still find shells and other things that might have been in the river when it was in that spot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, our, our rivers certainly move a lot. Um, so you can see that. And you can see if you go out into a desert after a rain and it dries up, you can see cracks in the, in the land that show where water at some point was. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can see that. If you're in downtown Reno, it's a little harder because we've channeled the river there. But um, if you go out to places where there's not people building things you, you're, and look around, um, you can see spots where water used to be a lot easier. Great questions today, you guys. Yeah. These are awesome. Someone is asking, how many lakes are there in Nevada? And do we have any man-made bodies of water? So that is a good question. Lakes, um, uh, I don't know. How many lakes do we have in Nevada? Oh, got a good number. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we do and there's, okay. So Google just says 200, 200 lakes and reservoirs. So, I mean, yeah, there's definitely man-made storage reservoirs um, mm -hmm. where we're storing water not a whole lot on the Carson. Um, there's more on the Truckee, but, um, and certainly, definitely water storage, man-made lakes in Southern Nevada to help feed um, Las Vegas for water. But yeah, so it says 200, 200 lakes and rivers and, or lakes and reservoirs and 600 stream and rivers, streams and rivers. Um, so it sounds like a lot of water, but we're still the driest state in the country. Um, so even with all those, lakes. It sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot of water. Uh -huh. Someone is asking, why are there so many hot springs in Nevada? 
Ooh, that's a good question too. Dang, you guys are good. Um, so that has to do with, you get into geology and geothermal um, things happening. And it's been a long time since my college geology courses, um, but it, it's, it has to do with all the rocks and the tectonic plates and things that are happening underneath the earth that are sending up um, hot water springs. Um, and yes, we do have a lot in Nevada and um, Eastern California in the Sierra Nevada. There's just, a, there's a ton of hot springs and it, it all has to do with geology. It, that's not a great answer to that question, but it's a little out of my current wheelhouse of, of information. Um, someone else is asking what formed the Carson River? What formed it? Well, it's fed by snowmelt and starts, there's two forks on the Carson River, the east and the west. Both start in the Sierra Nevada. Um, there's springs along the way that feed the Carson River. Um, also largely snowmelt and rainmelt, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that answered that question. What formed the Carson so, River? I mean, it, we, it really goes back to geology and all of that too, but um, it is a spring fed and snowmelt fed river. Someone is asking what the largest watershed in the world is. Would it be like the Amazon basin? I know that's kind of what I was thinking or the Nile. Um, yeah, I would think one of those. It just depends. See, that's what's so weird because it, you know, the river might be small, like the Walker River is, is pretty short, but it's a pretty big um, watershed and it includes, a, you know, quite a bit of land. Um, According almost 4,000 square miles of land. So what does Google say about the largest well, watershed? According to National Geographic, not oh, just Google. Yeah. <laughs> so a bit more credibility. The Amazon River watershed Makes sense. is the largest in the world because it drains a third of the entire South American continent. So even within that watershed, however, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of smaller little watersheds, but the main watershed, yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's a huge river system for sure. Someone is asking if every lake in the Great Basin is polluted. <laughs> well, yes. Um, when we look at pollution in lakes, one of the worst in our area is, is Lahontan Reservoir on the Carson River. And that has to do with both the fact that it's at the end of the river, because if you think about people who live upstream, whatever anybody does upstream near the start of the river or along the river, all of that flows downstream. So the people at the end are gonna get the worst of the pollution. Um, there's several reasons for Lahontan being so polluted. Most of it has to do with mining um, the mercury again. In the, in the mining days in Virginia City, they were using mercury, which I know kids today don't have a, as much of a frame of reference for mercury as those of us who are older and had mercury thermometers that we were so afraid to break because mercury is toxic. Um, but mercury is a chemical that they used because it would bind to gold and silver and hold on to it and pull it out of that rock really easily, um, relatively easily. And then they would dump that, not knowing um, the ramifications of that. They would just dump that mercury and it, it sticks around for a long, long time before it breaks down. So it fled downstream into Lahontan Reservoir and sunk into the sediment. Um, that's why we tell people not to eat fish from Lahontan. In fact, not to eat fish anywhere from Dayton all the way to Fallon along the Carson River because of that mercury pollution, especially kids um, whose brains are still growing because mercury likes to hang out in the tissue of the brain and can cause all kinds of problems. It's safe to be on that lake. There's people using that lake all the time for recreation. You just want to, if you're walking around in the dirt and along the bottom of the, of the lake and getting filthy, you want to take a good shower when you go home. But um, yeah, our, our water systems in Nevada are, 
are polluted, not in some cases more than other places in the country, in other cases, not so much. Um, on the Carson River, in fact, there's um, an environmental protection agency um, Superfund site, which is basically they're trying to figure out how to clean up that mercury. So it's highly polluted. At the same time, there's fish, there's wildlife, there's life existing. Um, so it, life has adapted to that um, pollution to some extent. Um, there's other causes of pollution, cows pooping in the river, um, ranching, farming, golf courses, even us, we're polluting the river just um, by existing, washing our clothes and chemicals are getting into the water. So yes, polluted, and we have some work to do, but we're also doing pretty well. I mean, it, it's not, oh, it's just tough. It's not the end of the end of life as we know it. So I don't want to alarm anybody with pollution, but you just need to be aware and be, um, be cognizant of that. All right. And when was the Humboldt River formed? I imagine a couple million years ago. Yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, that again is back to geology. And um, it formed at the same time the mountains and everything else formed um, and changed based over the years, moved around with flooding and um, all kinds of things. So it's been around a long time. All of our rivers have been around a long time. And uh, someone, I think, missed it earlier. How long is the actual path of the Humboldt River? <laughs> so the actual path is 380 miles in a given year. But yeah, that's the general idea. 380 miles. That's a long, long river. And then which river has the most trout? Do you happen to know this? Maybe Jan yeah. can weigh in. Yeah, Jan, we're, we're deflecting that to you. Hi. Um, so I think on the west, the the highest stream counts is the Green River. So um, first, it's like the first four sections of the green has some of the highest actual counts so for its size. Um, I believe that's the answer to that one. But that, today, oh, go ahead. Well, is that natural or stock? Um, so that is... Um, I'm sorry, I really put you on the spot I, there. No, no, no. <laughs> I think they do supplement that one, but I don't know how much. I don't know. Okay. Um, but that would be like in the, on the West Coast. As far as in our state, um, I don't know. I would say that maybe the, maybe the Truckee, because of its size, going closer to California, where we have, like you guys have, have touched on, more water all the time. So um, that's a good question. Great. All right, and then it looks like our last question is, how long have you guys been working? <laughs> um, so I've been with River Wranglers for about three years, um, actually about exactly three years, but I have been a river person for 30 years. Um, I've been rafting, kayaking, I just love being outside and in the water and I love kids. So this is just such a great job for me because I get to do all of those, all of those things, work with kids at the river. And Sydney, I'll let you. Mom, I've been the AmeriCorps for River Wranglers for over a year now. We have fun. And it's yeah. <laughs> because of you all watching out there. Hope to see you in person again soon. All right, and that looks like it was our last question, and I think we are done for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and showing us that wonderful video, and thank you to everyone else uh, for tuning in today. Bye. Thanks, thank you. Bye.